Everybody just lift up your hands right now. Just invite the King of Glory to come in to your mind and settle your mind because we've all mostly had busy weeks, certain things have happened. And Lord, just just still our minds today that you might be able to penetrate and, and touch us deep. For that we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. Psalm 37 verse 23 says this, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. It's an amazing thing that God delights in us. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. He goes on to say, I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord or established by the Lord. If only we realized how much God wants to work in our lives and wants to do good for us. He wants to uphold us with His hand. Even when we make mistakes, God loves us so much that He won't let us go. I want to say this this morning, don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Just let God's Spirit lead you to His perfect will. God has got a perfect will for your life. Jesus is the answer to all of man's needs. You might be here this morning and you've got great needs. Jesus is the answer. God is good and His mercy endures forever. Do you believe that today? Father, we, we really want to hear from you this morning. God, we just don't want to hear another sermon, another message, another preach. We just don't want to come to a church and come in and go out. But my God, we want to hear your voice. We want to open our hearts so that you can come in and you can touch us and you can meet with us. And Lord, you can take us by the hand and, and take us, Lord, wherever you want us to go, whatever you want us to do. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise, we'll give you all the glory. Amen. I want to continue uh, in the vein that I've been sharing over the last few ses sessions. Uh, I'm talking about possessing your vision, your God-given dream, your God-given vision. Not what I want necessarily, but what God wants in our lives. Whatever stands between you and what God has for you must either come down, be driven out, cast out, subdued or whatever through the mighty power that God has imparted and invested in you. Every believer, every person that's ever called upon the name of the Lord, God has invested in your life. God has imparted into your life. Sometimes there we don't understand just how great God is. In Judges chapter 6, I'm just going to paraphrase this. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho the city into your hands. It's king, Satan, and the mighty men of valor, demons. All things, he said, I've given into your hands. I've given the city, I've given the kings, I've given the mighty men of valor. And friend, as Christians today, you've got to understand and I have to understand today that God has given me everything that I need that pertains to God and this world. Everything that I need, has, God has given to me. And God has given me victory and He's given me power. He's given me authority over all the works of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt me. All J Joshua had was a word or a promise that God had impregnated with His power. God, when God speaks, He just doesn't speak to you. He impregnates what He speaks to you with the power of God to be able to bring what God has spoken to you to pass. Because in the natural, we can't do it. But when God says certain things, I have given you the city. I have given you its king. I have given you the mighty men of valor. Where Joshua was standing, it seemed impossible because of the circumstance. 
But what we need to understand and get a revelation of is that when God spoke those words, those words were impregnated. They were, they were marinated. They were infused. They were empowered with God's word, God's power. And, and that is why, what caused it to come to pass. We need to come into agreement with what God says and not what I feel. Joshua would have said uh, it is impossible. It would have been impossible. Joshua, all he had was a word or a promise that had the power of God in it. God says also, he says that the word will not return to him void, but it will accomplish that which is purposed to accomplish. In other words, that which I've empowered it to accomplish. And when Jesus said to go into all the world and lay hands on the sick, then they will recover, there's an empowerment in those words. When he says, go out and cast out demons, there's an empowerment that's in those words. And if we just think, sit back and say, it's impossible, well, nothing will happen. But if we do what Joshua did, then all things are possible. Amen. You don't have to get so excited just because I'm excited. <laughs> if you would have said that, it would have, it would have just been nothing else. God would have had to go and find another. One of the things is, is that when God starts to move and He starts to speak, and He might even speak to a church, He might even speak to an individual. We heard this morning about all the great men, Finney, all these people there that God touched and they rose up and they went. They went and did what they were supposed to do. That's because they said yes. I wonder how many people God spoke to before He found the one that said yes. I wonder how many churches God will have to visit before there's one that will rise up and say yes. Because God is continually moving, He's continually seeking, and He's going to find a bunch of people that will believe Him. And that's, a, that's an act of our will. God had chosen Moses to go in and, and, and possess the promised land. But instead of uh, speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. So God had to move on and find a Joshua to lead the people in. But I want to tell you, as sure as God made little apples, he's going to have a people that are going to go in. He's going to find a people that will go in and possess the possessions that God says that you can possess. Even though there may be a generation that die in a wilderness. Even though there may be a generation that, that can't see it. There will be, God will rise up a generation that will go in and possess everything that God says. Because God said, as surely as I live, all the earth will be filled with my glory. You might see the, the devastation and the trouble that people are going through today and, and what's going on, but I want to tell you God's word will be true. I saw a man on television the other night that was weeping over the, the trees that have been destroyed that, inha that have flying foxes in them. Now, if you like flying foxes, God bless you. But this poor man was, was as he was speaking, the, the passion, he was weeping over, over, over flying foxes. Would be to God that the church would begin to weep over the lost. Children that are being aborted. Kids that are being, being sold into slavery all over the place. Little kids, three and four years of age, being, being abused by pedophiles. Would be to God that we started to get a passion for the loss and start to cry out for that. I believe that God was going to have a... How many people believe God's going to have a people? David subdued a giant... Also a lion and a bear. He led the armies of God to a great victory. Joshua subdued walled cities, crossed flooded rivers, because they knew that no weapon formed against them could prosper. Isaiah 54, 17. Unbelief is conceived in the mind, and it will bring forth. Faith is conceived in your spirit and it develops through action. 
Faith is conceived in your spirit. And there's not one of us here today that haven't heard or sensed or felt or however you want to explain it, God speaking to your life. But when God speaks, He empowers that word to bring forth whatever He spoke. But it will only develop. I see little babies. And what a great sound to have little babies in the church. Hallelujah. Amen. But it's a good thing. But that little baby will not develop. It's, it's not going to stay a little baby. It wasn't just a thought in their minds, let's have a baby. But it, it, was, it was born, and now it's got to develop, and it's going to become a person. It's going to become a, a person of, of great power, whatever God has planned for it, if it allows it to. Faith is conceived in your spirit, and it develops through action by going out by doing something. If you don't do it, it won't happen. It won't develop. Negativity, unbelief, is conceived in your mind. And we know what happens with that. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, it says in the earlier note part, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. I believe that we have in Jesus, what we have to do is we have to drive out the enemy. Many are in our mind. We've got to cast down arguments. The argument when that word comes to you and says, I want you to do such and such. I want you to go over there and pray for that sick person. I want you to go and give that person a hundred dollars. I want you to do something over there or whatever it might be. I want you to go and help that person. When that, when that word comes, there's an argument that begins in our mind. If it's $100, you say, I can't afford it. If, if it's go and cast that devil out, or go and lead that person to Jesus, or go and talk to him about the Lord, all these thoughts come out up in our mind. But what you've got to understand is that the word that God spoke to you when he said, go and do that, is empowered, impregnated with the power of God. So when you do it, then God can do something more for you. And he can bless you abundantly more than you could ever imagine or think. What an amazing Savior we have today. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In other words, only believe what God says. Whatever God says you can have and do, when you believe that, all things are possible. Don't believe what the devil says about you. Don't believe the lies of him. 1 Corinthians 1.27 it says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God uses foolish things. He uses things there that says, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. How foolish is that? But I want to tell you, if you do it, it will work. You put to shame the things which are mighty. When David slew the Goliath, really what happened? See, we, we see the, and we read the story of the great exploit. David, run, you come to me in the, you know, with the, what it was to say, with a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And what an amazing thing. But you see, in the realm of the Spirit, where you and I necessarily can't see, but in the realm of the Spirit, when David was running towards that Goliath, because you see, the whole thing of Goliath was a plan of Satan to bring down the church, to bring down the people of God. We've got a little nation that's in the middle of whoop-whoop, in the middle of, 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 of chaos, totally surrounded by enemy, 
a little group of, I don't know, a couple of million people, but this couple of million people, because God said they are my people and you will not destroy them, I ought to tell you there's no devil in hell that will ever wipe out the children of God. Why? Because when God spoke it, He empowered it. And because He said it, He's going to make it happen. And He will protect those people. Because that's His plan. And you see, when David, because the Goliath was an attempt to come against the people of God, and, and I can imagine the demon, the, the devil, with all his demon powers. And as you would have said, I've found a man. i found a giant of a man. And this man is going to utterly destroy the armies of the living God. And we're going to put the armies of the living God to shame. And I want to tell you, he would have been gloating and all the demons would have been screaming and saying, yes, you're a great man. What a wonderful guy you are and everything like that. But I want to tell you, when David, when David ran towards that Goliath, and as he took that little slingshot, and as he pierced the brain of that devil, and as that, that giant of a thing fell to the ground, he put to shame the devil's plan. And I praise God, I praise God, that a little lad put to shame the plan of God, the plan of the enemy. And I thank God that whatever plan the enemy had for my life, it has been put to shame because God himself has raised us up. Amen? Give yourself a pat on the back today because God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Only believe. God has chosen the foolish, foolish things. When David slew the, the, Goliath, the Goliath, the devil was humiliated before all the demonic hosts. His plan was put to shame by a lad. Something that seemed and looked like total failure. The cross of Calvary was mankind's greatest victory. Amen? You've got to see a battered, bruised, and beaten Christ hanging by nails, driven into his hands and feet. I brought along something this morning. My bag of tricks. The closest thing I can think of to what was driven into Jesus' hands and feet. While he was there, and you know, we can see lovely pictures of a of, a, of an ivory Jesus. As they were driving those nails into his hands, he might have said, oh, a little bit to the left. <laughs> As they were slamming <laughs> into his hands and then his feet, the agony the suffering, how horrible. Hanging by nails, hanging on a piece of wood called the cross. But friend, that wasn't all that was happening. That would have been enough. Crown of thorns on his head, his back, open with the whip of the scourges. His body hardly recognizable as who he was. His face would have been slammed into the, into the gravel as the weight of the cross on his shoulders until they took it off him. Flesh hanging from him. That was bad enough. Just the pain, because... That's all you and I sometimes can understand is natural pain. But that wasn't really the pain that was really going through Jesus. Wave upon wave of man's iniquity, pounding his body. Wave upon wave, the excruciating pain would have caused his body to convulse. The weight of sin, murder, lies, Pedophilia, homosexuality, rape, abortion, anger, 
fraud, pride, jealousy. All this and more was laid upon him. Hour after hour, it kept coming, wave after wave, relentlessly pounding his body. Blood oozing from his wounds. A man who knew no sin is carrying the full weight of judgment for our sin. In the midst of all this, as the weight of it, the pressure of it, the he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't just the nails in his hands or his feet or, the, or his back open bare or, or the crown of thorns or anything else. It wasn't just that, that those things, but, but man, what really was affecting him is as he saw little children down there looking at him and, and shaking their fists at him, as they spat at him, as they plucked his beard, as they cursed him, as they cried out, if you are the Son of God, get yourself off this cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The weight of sin, the pressure, the relentless thing. The Bible talks about the day turned to night. There are earthquakes, great earthquakes. I believe there would be thunders and lightnings and flashes and, and stuff going on as, a, as, a, as a, the day turned to night. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there comes a cry. It is finished. I don't know if you understand or if we can ever comprehend or if we can somehow or other get a little bit of a grip or a little bit of a grasp on what Jesus was saying that day to you and to me, and those words are still echoing through the chambers of time. They're still as powerful today as the day that they were spoken, as he cried out, It is finished! And as he cried those words out, it says that the curtain was rent from top to bottom, and the way that separated man from God was opened, and I ought to tell you, God was let loose. But the lies of Satan, the lies of the enemy, the lies, the lies, the lies. Keep flowing, keep flowing. The battle's won. Mankind is free. Like a bird out of the snare of the fowler. Friend, don't allow yourself to get snared up with, with false doctrines and false religions and false stuff. And don't let your mind get so messed up with unbelief. Don't let your heart get hardened, but be loosed in Jesus' name. Amen. Curtain was rent. Revelation 1 18, it says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. I want to say to you again that those words are carry the mantle, they carry the anointing, they are impregnated with the power of God. Amen. I am he who lives and but was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and of death. Those words again are echoing through the chambers of time. Satan would hear those words. He would try to put them away. But I want to tell you, friends, the more we sing it, the more we shout it, the devil will hear it every day. Amen. He is risen, praise God. He is risen. He has been glorified. He is the King of kings. He wears the victor's crown. Amen. He has triumphed over hades and death. He is a mighty God and worthy to be praised. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hades and of death. Hades there speaks about the unseen realm. God wants to open the unseen realm to us. God, through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, has restored everything that the devil stole at the garden. The devil that's inside your husband, 
your wife, your boss, your workplace bully is no match for the power of God that's inside of you. We've got to start to use what God has given to us. Don't allow yourself to be dominated and controlled by some ungodly thing. Rise up against it. Ephesians 1.18 and it says, What is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He worked through Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him in heavenly places, amen, and made His feet... Oh, I forget the words anyhow, you know it. What is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He worked through Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him in heavenly places far above principalities and powers and dominion and might not only in this age but that which is to come. And He has put all things under His feet. You believe that today? Don't tolerate the devil. Don't tolerate the lies. Don't tolerate it. Rise up. Don't allow that demonic force that's trying to get hold of you. It's through your husband, your wife, or unsaved person, whatever it might be. Rise up and take authority. He says, I give you power to cast out... To, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this too. I give you power to cast out serpents and run off scorpions and stop all the works of Satan, and he won't be able to touch you. You believe that today? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Why? Because you're going to put, you're not going to put up with it. You're going to run him off. We're not going to put up with it, friend. Don't put up with it. Don't, don't put up with it. Oh, the devil got me. <laughs> I've been buffeted by the devil. Well, don't put up with it. <laughs> Run him off. <laughs> uh, God has given us dominion. We are to subdue. Subdue means to conquer, to bring into subjection, to overcome. We're going to subdue, to conquer, bring into subjection, to overcome. To him who overcomes, to him who subdues. It says there in Revelation, it says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me upon my throne, even as I have subdued and have overcome and am seated in heavenly places and seated beside my Father. To him who subdues, to him who overcomes, to him who triumphs over the devil, to him who doesn't tolerate it, to him who runs the enemy off. You can say it however you want to say it, but friend, I want to tell you, that's for the ones that wear the victor's, victor's crown with Jesus. God wants us to rise up and be the church, not a bunch of wimps. Subdue means to conquer, bring into subjection, to overcome. To him who overcomes. The, uh, dominion, it means to rule, to tread down. To rule, to tread down. Dominion. You are more than a conqueror. The, nev the devil knows he is defeated. Turn to somebody and say, the devil knows he is defeated. I said, the devil knows he's defeated. Then I want you to ask the person, do you? The devil knows he's defeated, do you? God himself wants you to live in victory. Can I say it again? God himself wants you and me to live in victory. It's just not the name of a church. I got a victory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
You can even have it on your number plate. God himself wants you to live in victory. Turn to somebody and tell them that. They might be the first time they've heard it. The devil goes around, we all know this one, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He got me the other night. But I've got news for you. Jesus the Christ goes around, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, seeking whom he may empower. Get rid of that other one. <laughs> the devil goes around like a roaring lion, but Jesus is the lion. Amen? He goes around seeking whom he may empower. Friend, I did the best I could. I did the best I could. Nelly spat my teeth out three times. <laughs> I've got nothing left to say. I just got to let the Holy Ghost do its work. Amen? Jesus paid the price in full. He wears the victor's crown. He wears the victor's crown. He has triumphed over hell and death. You've got to just open up your spirit. Let the truth of what you're, what's going on, let the truth touch my life. Go on, just pray. The Bible says in John 10.10, 10, it says there's a thief who comes to rob to kill and destroy. A lot of people where the thief has come and is robbed, is killed, not physically, but just killed things like marriages and dreams and purpose and plan and has destroyed the future of men and women. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus is not the thief. He wants to give you life. Why wouldn't you want to give your life to this Jesus? Why wouldn't you want to surrender all? For many Christians today, we, we're sitting around waiting for the rapture. Well, I've said it many times, I hope we have a rupture before we have the rapture. I hope we have a wake-up before... Whatever, whatever you believe. But this one thing I do know is Jesus loves you and he's not going to bring wrath against you. He's going to bring his love to you. He's going to help you overcome. Where you've failed, he wants to be the one that will help you succeed. I want to say to you today, if you've never given your life to this Jesus, give him your life today. Christians, if you're just hanging around, tiptoeing through the tulips with tiny Tim, waiting for the rapture, can I encourage you to get another vision, to get another dream? Like the man with the flying foxes. Not flying foxes, but see the lost. Go after the lost. Do whatever you can to save the lost. While our heads are bowed right now, eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you today, if you see a need in your life that you want to surrender to him, you want to say, Jesus, would you 
save me? Would you help me? Would, would you forgive me all the wrong that I've ever done in my life? I thank God that it didn't matter how much because as he hung upon that tree, he's already carried it for you. Wave upon wave hit him and mine and yours was in one of those waves. But what the enemy doesn't want you to do is say yes to Jesus. And then right now in your mind there will be arguments why you shouldn't do it. But I've got one why you should if he died for you and he loved you and he's asking you to come to him. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed right now and you're going to say, Jesus, would you please touch me? Help me. I don't want to embarrass you but I want you to know Jesus. Would you quickly slip up your hand in this house today? Say, that's me today. I want to know this Jesus. I want to get to know him. I want to know him. I want to know him. I don't know everybody in this place today. If you don't know Jesus, now is the time to do it. This is the time. Simply by saying yes, you can just simply slip up your hand. I say, oh, that's I don't care what you say, just do what you know your heart's telling you to do. Last time I'm going to ask, slip it up right now. Slip it up right now. Place your hand. Put it down. There's people in this place here today, and I know that you're in. Oh, Jesus. You know you need that touch from the Master's hand today. You just need that touch. Touch. Again, I've just got to let the Holy Ghost talk to your heart so you can respond not to Neil but to Him.